Hi, today I'm going to be taking a look at the MIU Mini. In this video, I've tried to put together a comprehensive guide of everything you need to know to get started with the MIU Mini, as well as how to customize it and configure it so that you can get the best out of your system. So let's get started. The MIU Mini is a tiny handheld from the same people that did the BitBoy about a couple of years ago. You can see from the picture on the box and the bit boy I've got in my hand that the two are very, very similar. There was a number of things I really didn't like about the bit boy. I love the form factor. It's pretty tiny. It's pretty compact and easy to slip into your pocket. But things I didn't like about it, the screen was just that little bit too small. The other thing for me was the buttons. I'd expect A and B to be here and here, not here and here. I just couldn't get a grips with that. It was just a nightmare. I, I gave up for that one reason alone. Other things, I didn't like the operating system and it was a bit underpowered as well. So this ended up in the box with a lot of my other handhelds. So the MIU Mini hopefully addresses all of these problems. And you can see from the box, it does appear to have the A and B buttons in the right place and the screen, well, it's almost bezel this there. I mean, it's, it's taken up pretty much the whole width of the box. But anyway, let's get this box opened up and see what you get. Okay, so there's the, the Miu Mini itself. That's really nice. And I'll tell you now, it's got a much more solid feel to it than the previous one, the, the BitBoy. Much better feeling. The, the BitBoy feels very light, the plastic pretty hollow. And I, I wouldn't describe it as flimsy, but it's just nowhere near as solid as this. And you can see the two side by side, with the Miu Mini even smaller than the BitBoy. And thankfully, they've got the A button here and the B button there. The D-pad feels great. Select and start. So these are hard plastic buttons and they're a little bit clicky, but you're not going to be pressing them that much. But yeah, this feels great. Now at the side, there's a volume wheel here. At the bottom, we've got the headphone jack, a USB-C port for charging, and the micro SD card slot. On this side, absolutely nothing. At the top, we've got the power button, and I think that's for three LEDs. Around the back, there's the right shoulder button, R1, R2, L1, L2. It's very difficult to tell, but The L2 and R2 stick out slightly further than the other two. So basically when you rub your fingers across it here, you can feel a, a ridge where you're hitting that other one. So you can tell the buttons apart. So when you're in the middle of a game, you're at no risk of pressing the wrong one by mistake. We've also got the battery compartment here. It's uh, looks like a 3.5 or 3.8 volts. 1900 milliamp hour battery, uh, lithium ion. So hopefully there'll be on AliExpress or somewhere replacement batteries for this. Okay, so what else is in the box? Well, there's the instruction leaflet. A little USB adapter so you can stick your micro SD card slot in here, and plug it into your computer. And a very, very short USB-A to USB-C cable for charging. So let's take a quick look at the instructions. I'm, I'm not going to read them all out or anything stupid like that. I just want to find out what sort of thing they're covering here. Well, the th first thing that strikes me is that, first of all, it's quite a nice glossy leaflet. It's in English. And yeah, there are some Chinese here. But yeah, the whole thing looks uh, looks really nice, pretty comprehensive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this away, get it charged up, and then once it's fully charged, we'll come back and look at the initial setup process. Okay, so now that the Miu Mini is fully charged, I'm going to boot it up for the first time.
I've got to say the screen looks very crisp already, just judging by the, the logo on boot up. Now in case you're wondering, the the card that's in the slot that the device came with is a 32 gig, completely unbranded card. So I'm going to make that a priority to replace that. What I'll do is I'll just keep this as a backup and copy everything onto a new card. So let's have a look and see what's under game. So we've got uh, arcade games, Famicom, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance. Uh, I've got both arcade and then main plus. Mega Drive, Master System, Neo Geo. And then on the second page, Neo Geo Pocket, PC Engine, PlayStation, Super Famicom, and Wonder Swan Color. So I don't know if this actually comes with any games, but let's have a quick look at Game Boy, for example. Okay, so yeah, it is loaded up with a lot of games here. Looking in the corner, just here where my thumb is, uh, you can see 1,354. So wow, yeah, it does come with quite a bit. So what I want to do is to take a look at the RetroArch options that we have. Now, I've got to say, even though this screen is much bigger than the one on the BitBoy, it is still pretty small and difficult to read. You really wouldn't want to be going any smaller than this. Maybe it's just my eyes, I don't know, but I mean, I can read it just about, but uh, it is pretty small. Under the RetroArch option, you've got a whole load of the RetroArch cores, which they've set up here. So the Gambatu one, for example, I'm assuming that's gonna let us play Game Boy games. So I don't know if there's anything set up under this. Oh, okay, there's a whole load of Chinese stuff. So it looks like they've got some of the main stuff set up here, but, but it's in Chinese. And for the other emulators, there doesn't appear to be anything at all. So you'd need to set these up yourself. It's interesting how they've got Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, but not Game Boy Color. Now, I don't know if they've dumped the Game Boy Color stuff in with Game Boy. So let's take a look at 1942. So I knew this was a Game Boy Color game. So it looks like they have dumped Game Boy Color and Game Boy into the same folder. Now, one thing I'd like to do is to be able to resize to get them in the proper original aspect ratio. So let's look at the native menu. Now, the problem here is that the native menu is the native menu for whatever emulator they're using behind the scenes. And with RetroArch, if we switch to using RetroArch, then it'll be exactly the same menu across everything. Uh, whereas with this, the options you get and the way they're presented, as I say, are very much determined by that emulator that they've chosen to use. So what options have we got? We can see frames per second, I'll turn that on. Uh, scalar, so that's set to full screen, so we can change that to 1.5 times or none. Let's leave it at none. Wow. You're going to need to bring your binoculars to see this, I think. That's tiny. So let's change that to one point five. See what that's like. Okay, I mean that's a bit better. I mean it's it's almost filling the height of the screen, but it's keeping the original and correct aspect ratio. So I might just leave it at that. So if you look at the top corner here, I don't know if you can see that, it's showing you the frame, frame rate and that's set to 60, so absolutely fine. In this next part, I'm going to be taking you through backing up the micro SD card that came with your Mio Mini, as well as everything that comes as stock on the system. So let's take a look. So before I get on to backing up the existing card and creating a new one, let's take a quick look at what sort of content they've provided us with on this card. Now you see the currently selected system in 
white lettering. And looking under our cage, you can see there's a couple of folders here where they've kind of grouped some stuff there. But on the main list, uh, they've got uh, 72 games and like 63 within the, the shoot folder. And then beneath Arcade, they've got Main Plus, which is a bit of a strange way of doing it. But everything on here seems to be grouped by emulator as opposed to the platform itself. Uh, and under Main Plus, we've got 410 games. So there's a decent selection, but my favourite, uh, Mr. Do, is not one of those listed there, which is a pity. So moving across to Famicom, you can see that there's 386 games in there. Under Game Boy, 1,354. Now, obviously, if you've got to scroll from top to bottom, it's going to take quite a bit of time in there. And it remembers the position you were in when you last looked at it and will jump back in at that position. So under Game Boy Advance, we've got 1067. Mega Drive, 848. Master System, 291. And Neo Geo, 152 games. So scrolling across to the next page, we've then got Neo Geo Pocket, where they've got 40 games. PC Engine, 291. Now you'll probably notice that most of these seem to be Japanese ones, certainly all of the ones so far. And PlayStation, there's only nine, but you know, they've stuck on Bloody Roar 2 on there, which is one of the toughest games to emulate. Super Famicom, 785. I think it's quite nice to see that they've made an effort to stick on for any particular platform, most, if not all, of the, the games that were available. I mean, clearly that's not the case for PlayStation, but uh, for some of the other ones, the easier to run games, they, they've stuck on loads. So going into the RetroArch option, what they've done is that for the different cores, they've got uh, an icon there. So, So what you'll notice is that for quite a few of these, there's uh, pretty much nothing. All of the games seem to be under the standalone emulators. Now, here we've got uh, Final Burn Neo, and you can see here that there's 72 games, and again, they've got the, the shooter option. But I suspect this is exactly the same as the content that you had under Arcade. So again, just scrolling through these, no content at all. Now this isn't a problem because we can populate that with our own games. Now looking at MAME 2003, they've got 210 games in here, but I haven't a clue what any of them are because they're all labelled in Chinese. MAME 2003 Plus, we've got 410, but again, that's the same as the standalone option. And 39 under MAME 2010. to MGBA, which is a great Game Boy Advance emulator, nothing under that either. But you know what, I'm not too bothered about that. So we've got 152 under Neo Geo. I'm not too bothered about the fact that most of these are empty because they've got so many games they've given you on the standalone emulators. And if I didn't want to use the standalone emulators and wanted to use RetroArch, I could just shift those ROMs across to here and use the RetroArch cores instead. So here we have the PCSX rearmed, and you'll see there's nine games here. And it's the same nine games that were listed for the standalone emulator. 
I think because of the size of the PlayStation games, they've tried not to duplicate them across the card uh, so as not to fill it up completely. So I think they're using a shared folder for those. So let's take a look under App. So I don't know if you can kind of make that out because the main title's in Chinese, but then underneath it, uh, you can see the Dingux Commander CN for Mayu Mini. And all it is is basically a, a file manager type application, just to enable you to copy things from one location to another and delete stuff, etc. all the typical file manager type functions. We've then got OpenBore. And selecting this, it'll take you to a black screen and it'll see that for quite some time. Now this will work, but uh, to be honest, I find it a little bit flaky to say the least, and I'm not sure it's actually worth the, the time and effort. I find that the only way to get, uh, get it to respond like this is to start pressing some of the buttons. Now there's only two options under here. The first one, Night Slasher, no idea what that is or how good it is. And the second one, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But as I say, the time and effort to actually get into this, I don't even know if it's worth it. Especially considering how many other games are on this machine. So let's take a look at this third option here. I've no idea what it is because the whole thing's in Chinese. Yeah, well, this might be a great game, but only if you speak Chinese, because there's no way I have a clue what's going on here. I mean, the graphics seem fine, but uh, without being able to read this, it's all a bit pointless. So we've got a fourth option here, which is a shutdown option. And if I scroll down a bit further, we've got the main option for RetroArch. So going in here, we can set up RetroArch uh, and it's got all the options in here. So that's it. So if I just back out of that, it takes us back to the main menu. And looking at settings, we can see what we've got here. So you can see there's an option there for brightness. Now this is only set to four out of 10, so you could get this blindingly bright. The language, I'm just going to leave it as it is. And there's also a key mapper, which is interesting. So if we go into that, what you'll see here is that any of the buttons you've got, well, we'll say any of the buttons, uh, your trigger buttons, your left, right, L2, R2, and your X, Y, A, B, and Y buttons can all be changed to something else. So whatever you feel most comfortable with, you can change it to that configuration. And it's something that's very easy to do. If you get annoyed by the background music, which I do, uh, this is the place to come to turn that right down to zero so that you don't have to listen to that awful noise in the background. Now the Hibernate option is something that I highly recommend you set. And you can choose up to 30 minutes, or you can choose it to never hibernate. Personally, I leave it to five minutes. So that way, if I've put, it, put the device down and I've just left it on the table, gone away and done something else, it will hibernate, go into hibernate mode after five minutes. Our next option shows us the device information. And then we've got a hardware tester which allows us to test all of the buttons and make sure everything's working. So pretty straightforward, press the button on the device and on the screen you should see the corresponding button or D-pad move as well. And at the beginning of the menu, right at the very start, we've got uh, recent and favorite. So obviously, as the name implies, your recent games are going to be listed under recent and whatever you've marked as a favorite will appear there, which is great because it gives you a quick way to get into your favorite games instead of scrolling through those huge menus. Now that we've covered what's on the device when you get it, let's start taking a look at how you go about adding your own ROMs and updating the firmware it came with. 
However, before you do any of that, I recommend you back up the card that came with your Miu Mini and replace it with a bigger and more reliable one. This will allow you to add more ROMs and you won't have to worry about your card potentially going corrupt on you at any point in time and losing everything on the card. Now, you don't need to go mad when you're buying a new card. I found that a 64 gig card is more than enough for me and that's what I'm going to be using here. Now, before you add any files to your Miu Mini, or make any changes at all, here's what I recommend you do. What I've done is I've taken the micro SD card out of the Mio Mini and popped it into a card reader on the computer. And this is uh, what you can see here, shut up as USB drive, uh, G drive there. And here's the folders that are on it. And what I've done is I've created a folder on my computer. It doesn't matter where you create it, anywhere, that, anywhere you want, it could be in your desktop, wherever. And I've just called mine Mio Mini Backup of Original Card. And I've done a file by file backup. And as you can see, I've already done it. But basically all I did is just highlight all of the stuff that was on the card. And I did it uh, to show view hidden files. Uh, it doesn't look like there is any, but uh, it's always worth switching that on. And I've just highlighted all of these and just dragged them across into here. And as I say, you can see them all here. And that's it. Now the other thing I did, and you don't really need to do this, I just did it as a belt and braces thing, is I also created a, a, an image of that card and I did that using uh, the Win32 disk imager. So all you need to do is uh, click on this, go to a folder where you want to store it and give the image file a name, and in my case I called it Miu Mini Original Card .img. And then click on the read button and what it does as it says beneath the button there it reads the data from the device to the image file so i could flash that whole thing back the original card back uh, from this image file to a 32 gig card if i wanted to but having done this and like i say the file by file is the, is the important one that's the one to really do so having done this i can now put my 64 gig card into a card slot and copy the files from here back across. So I could just carry on there, safe in the knowledge that I'm actually using bigger, more reliable, better micro SD card. And even if you don't want to update the firmware or do anything like that or use alternate uh, custom firmware, it's still worth doing this exercise. In fact, I, I definitely recommend taking a backup as I've done here. We've covered what's on the stock setup you get with the Miu Mini. And a lot of people might be happy just leaving it like that. But what if you want to make a few changes, such as adding more ROMs or changing to a bigger, more reliable micro SD card? Well, let's take a look at that now. I've decided to use a 64 gig card to replace the unbranded 32 gig card that came with the Miu Mini. And I'm going to be using a utility called Rufus to format the new card to FAT32. I'll leave a link to where you can download this in the description below. Rufus is pretty straightforward to use, but I'll run through my settings with you. Probably the most important thing is to make sure that you're formatting the correct drive. So make sure you check that. In the boot options, choose non-bootable. I leave the partition scheme and target system set to their defaults of MBR for the partition and BIOS or UEFI for the target system. Under file system, make sure that large FAT32 is selected. Now it's not important whether or not you change the volume label for the card, but it's something I like to do as it makes working out which card is which a hell of a lot easier when it's plugged into my computer. Like I said though, it's up to you. After that, you can click on the start button. A warning will pop up and at that point you can click OK to proceed. The format process itself is pretty quick. And once it's finished, you can just click on the close button. So let's take a look at the newly formatted card. You can see the card with the Miu Mini label I specified, and in the root of the card are two files that you don't need. So I'm going to delete these. Now I'm going to go to the folder on my hard drive where I did that file by file backup of the original 32 gig card. And what I'm going to do is select all of the contents of the old card that's sitting in that folder and drag and drop it to my newly formatted 64 gig card. Okay, so now that has finished, I'm gonna move on to adding some more PlayStation games to the card, now that I have space to add a few. 
I'm using PlayStation as an example, but you can use the same method to add any games you want to whatever system you want. When adding your games, it's important to realise that there are two places where they can be stored on the Miu Mini. There is the ROMs folder, where ROMs for the standalone emulators are stored, and then there's the R ROMs folder, where ROMs for the RetroArch cores are stored. The folder for the PlayStation ROMs seems to be shared between the standalone emulator and the RetroArch core. One PlayStation game could be the size of an entire library for another platform, so I'm assuming that this is to save on space. And you can see here that the RetroArch folder for PCX Rearmed is empty. RetroArch does a great job when it comes to arcade games, and you can see some of the CPS and main folders are populated with games. Let's come out of the RetroArch ROMs folder and take a look at the ROMs folder for the standalone emulators. The PlayStation folder is the one labelled PS and inside here you'll see the nine PlayStation games that the Miu Mini came with. So let's move to the window on the left of the screen where I have my library of PlayStation games stored on my computer. Now you'll notice that the PlayStation ROMs on the Miu Mini are in PBP format but the ROMs I have on my computer are in CHD format. It doesn't matter that they're different formats, as both will work. Now rather than embarrass myself by accidentally selecting something like a whole load of Barbie games, I'm going to pick three games I like and use them as an example. And just like before, I'm going to drag the ROMs from the direction of the computer over to the Miu Mini microSD card and drop them in there. And there we are. You can see that the three games I copied over are now showing at the bottom of the list on the Miu Mini card, along with the other PlayStation games that were already on the card. And you can use this drag and drop method to copy games for any of the supported platforms into the folder for that platform for either the standalone emulators or RetroArch. Now that we've covered what you get with the stock firmware and how to add your own games to both the standalone emulators and RetroArch, it's time to take a look at the firmware. I'm going to be covering how you can update the stock firmware to the latest version, as well as taking a look at custom firmware and how you can use this to get the very best experience from your Miu Mini. This is Miu's site where you can get the firmware upgrades for the Miu Mini. I'll leave the link in the description below. Now, you've probably noticed that the whole thing is in Chinese and there doesn't seem to be an option on the page to translate it into English. So what I did was to install a browser extension to use Google Translate to translate the page for me. There will almost certainly be a selection of similar extensions for whatever desktop browser you're using. So with the page translated, we can see that there are a few updates on the page, with the most recent, at the time of this recording, being the one released on the 8th of January this year, 2022. I'd always go for the most recent, and that's exactly what I'm going to do here. If we click on that release, it takes us through to another page, so I'll translate that one too. And you can see that this page tells us about the changes that are in the release of the firmware. There were some particularly significant changes in this release, so this is definitely a worthwhile update. Also on the page are the instructions to install the update, but first I'm going to click on the link to get it. There are a couple of download options, and this one is stored on Google Drive, so I'll right click on the file and choose download. Once the file is finished downloading, you need to extract it, and inside you'll find the instructions in a text file. Open this up and it gives more detail about the changes in this release, rather than being the actual instructions on performing the upgrade. But that's fine, as it's all on the website anyway. So, going back to their website, you'll notice that the key thing they're emphasising is to remove the battery from the Miu Mini before you perform the upgrade on it. All of the instructions I'm covering here relate to this specific release. So if you're working with a different or newer firmware release, then make sure you follow the instructions that come with the release you're going to be using. Don't just blindly follow what I'm doing here because 
They could change the way the upgrades get implemented and I'm sure you don't want to end up bricking your device because you didn't follow the instructions properly. Let's get started with the upgrade process. The first thing we need to do is copy the .img file that is in the firmware folder inside the extracted zip file and we need to copy it over to the root of the micro SD card from the Miu Mini. With the Miu Mini shut down I took my card out and put it in a card reader in my computer. Once that is done, safely eject the card. Now for the risky part. If you don't follow the instructions exactly, there is a good chance you will brick your device. So the first thing to do is to remove the back cover of the Miu Mini and remove the battery. This is something that is stressed very heavily on the Miu website. Without any power connected to your Miu Mini, put the card with a .img file on it back in the slot. You're going to need a USB-C power charger. Again, this bit is important. Miu stress not to use something that is Type-C to Type-C because this could put too much power into the device. The best thing to use is something that supplies more, no more than 5 volts and the one I'm using is 1 amp. Make sure you're using a proper power adapter and not one of the sockets on your computer or a power bank. At no point should you press the power button either. Connect your power supply to the device and you should see a system upgrade message on the screen. Don't touch anything while the upgrade process is happening. When it's completed, you should see a green battery on the screen and it should say charging. At this point, you can unplug the power and you need to remove the card from the Miu Mini. Our next step is to put the card back into the computer and delete the .img file from the root of the card. If you don't do this, then it will try and do the firmware update all over again the next time you power on. Finally, you need to copy the three folders that are in the TF card folder of the zip file you downloaded and drop them into the root of the card. If you get any messages about files existing, then just choose the option to replace the existing ones with the new ones. Now that we looked at the stock setup for the Miu Mini and how to update it to the latest firmware, what other options do you have if you want to tweak things a little bit further? Well, you could go down the custom firmware route. When it comes to installing custom firmware on your Miu Mini, please realise that this is entirely optional. You definitely don't need to do this. And installing it can put your Miu Mini at risk and you could end up with a brick device. However, if you were comfortable enough installing the stock firmware upgrade, then installing custom firmware is a very similar process. The sort of thing you'll be getting by installing custom firmware is a wider range of systems to play, as well as a different look and feel, and a general, more consistent approach to the way the whole thing is set up. For example, the Miu Mini has a range of standalone emulators, where each emulator does things slightly differently. Now don't get me wrong, I think the Miu Mini does a great job of bringing a bit of consistency to the whole thing with the pop-up menu that the menu button gives you. But then it has RetroArch as well, which is a great inclusion, but RetroArch works in a completely different way and has a completely different menu. And given the huge range of systems that RetroArch can support, do you really need the standalone emulators and RetroArch? So this is where some of the custom firmware builds come in. The people behind these take the great build that the Miu Mini comes with and then they put their own slant on how they think things should work and they refine it, streamline it and make it better. Now if you decide to go with a custom firmware build you need to realise that the authors of these builds will almost certainly not have any ROMs included with that firmware build because doing that would be illegal. So you're going to need to provide your own ROMs as well as your own BIOS files. And you're going to need to populate those ROMs and BIOS files on the card yourself. So there is going to be a bit of work involved on your part. So where do you go about sourcing your ROMs and BIOS files? Well, unfortunately, I can't provide you links to that for legal reasons. But what I can tell you is that they are easily found. And as always, Google is your friend. Now, you could just use the ROMs that came with the Miu Mini, but there's a lot of Chinese ROMs in there as well. So, 
it might be worth looking at starting with a clean slate. It's up to you. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those ROMs, a lot of them, and you could just use those as a starting point. If you want to use your own ROM sets, then my advice would be to look for those which adhere to the no intro standard. Now, all you got to do, go to Google and do a search for no intro ROM set and then system name, and you'll come up with something. Uh, you, generally, you'll get a full pack for a particular system. And as I've said, there's a lot of good stuff there that comes with the stock card, which you could use as a starting point. But if you're going to go down the custom firmware route, then you are going to have to do a bit of legwork yourself as well. Now, if you decide to go with a custom firmware, then it really is a good idea to start with a brand new card formatted to the FAT32 standard, as I've shown you how to do in this video already. In the description, I've linked to some of the custom firmware options that I'm aware of at the time of creating this video. Each of these has different benefits and they've got slightly different installation instructions. Now, the benefits and features are going to change with each release of the different custom firmware options and possibly the installation methods for them as well. So rather than cover each of them in this video, and risk you looking at outdated information, I recommend that you check out the links to the pages for some of the custom firmware that I've left in the description below. So let's take a very quick look at some of the options that you have to choose from. Now, the first one I'm gonna look at is called Tacky, and it's, I believe, from Tacky Udon, who is a well-known YouTuber and reviewer. And you can see here that the purpose of this, uh, he says the repository contains a deep bloated and improved SD card image for the Miu Mini. And if we scroll down, he's got uh, some instructions here. And again, he recommends creating uh, a, a new card formatted to FAT32. And if we look at the range of systems it supports, you'll see that it actually supports a few more systems than the stock image does. Uh, the ones that kind of jump out at me are the Amstrad and uh, I believe the Ataris as well. And scrolling down a little bit, um, the BIOS files are included with a stock SD card have been removed from this package. Um, so yeah, you're gonna need to stick in your own BIOS files. You're gonna find those which I've mentioned already. And also it doesn't include any ROMs. And I think that's gonna be the case for every one of the custom firmware images. So let's move on to the next one. So again, the purpose of this image, uh, it, it says it's enhanced, cleaned up and de-bloated. And to be honest, I think that's the theme through all of the custom firmware images that you'll find, that they're really just looking to streamline what the stock image provided. So this one works fully with uh, the RetroArch. You can load ROMs and cores directly from the RetroArch menu if you want to. And if we scroll down a little bit more, now, one of the things about this is he's also got some ports in here, such as Doom and Quake, which is quite nice to see. He's listed out the default cores. Now, this doesn't support as big a range of systems uh, as the previous one from Turkey did, but uh, it does look quite nice. And one of the things it's got is adding box art, because as you've probably seen with the Miu Mini, it's just text, just text descriptions, that's it. The name of the game, uh, no box art pictures at all, but this shows you here and allows you to actually add box art. So let's move on to the next one, and this is the one that uh, I'm sorely tempted to install, and it's called Onion. And there's just recently been a new release of this, version 3. So if we just scroll down here, you'll see here that... Uh, one of the things it offers is a custom installer. So you can actually decide which systems you're gonna be installing uh, and which ones you don't want to have installed. Game activity, you can see how long you've been playing each game for. And it's just little things like this that seem to make this stand out from everything else. It really does seem to be a big improvement on that stock firmware that the Mio Mini ships with. RetroArch user interface improvements. So yeah, I mean, this looks good and this is the one I'm sorely tempted to install. So lastly, there's one here called Triforce X and I'm mentioning this just because it's worth bearing in mind this one. But the problem is that at the moment, 
it says here that medium mini support will happen. Please be patient. So it's not actually here, but I'm just making you aware of it uh, for whatever point in time they actually have it up there and working. And it's certainly going to be worth taking a look at, I feel. So, in conclusion, what do I reckon to the Mio Mini? Honestly, I absolutely love it. Sure, I wish the screen was a little bigger, and the processor a little faster, and it could maybe play systems above the PS1, such as the Dreamcast. But then it wouldn't be the size that it is, and that's one of the best things about it. As a Take Anywhere device, I really haven't come across anything that comes close to beating this for the size, convenience, and performance. I can literally pop this in a shirt pocket. Now try doing that with a Steam Deck, or an Odin for that matter. This is ideal to take anywhere and play whenever you have the opportunity. So have I loaded a custom firmware onto mine? Well, I've got to admit, I'm sorely tempted and I do keep looking at Onion longingly. Would you like me to create a video going through that process? And how to set it up with a new custom firmware? Let me know in the comments below. Well, that's it for this video, and hopefully you found it useful. And if you did, a like and subscribe would be very much appreciated. And thanks for watching.